All right, we are live. All right, T minus four minutes. Herb, man, you're like early, brother. You're like early. So I love it. Hey, man, how can I get a thumbs down when I haven't even started? <laughs> oh, there's so many haters in this world. I got a thumbs down before I even started. That's a record, man. That's pretty good, man. Anyway, man, let me know where you're from. Where are you from, uh, Herb? Let me know what's up. Where are you from? All right, I'll wait for people to jump on board. Another episode of, I'm just calling this, Sales After Dark. Yeah. Somebody asked me, why did I call it Sales After Dark? Well, because it's at nighttime and it's after dark. Dinero y motivación otra vez again. Hola. DM, where are you from? I forgot. Gracias. Great to see you, Victor. JL. Thank you, man. Remember, man, tell me where you're from, man, because I forget where you guys are from. Thank you for joining me. It's going to be a cool event. Oklahoma, once again. Take no mountains in Oklahoma. That's the only problem. Brian, what's happening? Canada in the house. Uh, Playa de Carmen, Mexico. I've been there, by the way. I've actually been there. Uh, here from South Jersey, man, hanging in. Hope you guys are doing well. Uh, Dinero, thank you for being my fan. Appreciate it. Missouri, Missouri, Colorado, home of Toastmasters. I didn't know that. Colorado is a home of Toastmasters. I did not know that. Malaysia, been to Singapore. That's about it. Does that count? I love that area, man. So many. I mean, it's uh, it's amazing how modern. Like when you go to like Singapore, it's just amazing city. Just amazing city. A lot of rules, though. A lot of rules, if you know what I'm talking about, right? A lot of rules, man. All right. Ransom Barrel. Ransom, I think I've, I remember you, because that name, I just can't forget that name. Ransom Barrel. That's like the coolest name. That should be like a movie star name. Naples, Florida. Nice place. Properties are too expensive, but that's all good. By the way, if you're just if you're joining in right now, again, uh, give me a couple of minutes to let people roll in. And if you're watching this on the replay, fast forward to about three minutes and before we get going. Uh, Peru, Illinois, Chicago, Illinois. So yeah, welcome aboard. Emiliano Quintero. Uh, let me see. Action News. Good evening. Oh, buenas noches. Yeah. Buenas noches. Right. ¿Cómo está? Muy bien. Me alegro. Gracias. Uh, Jared Camp. Oh man, just Jared. Hola, Victor, desde Puerto Rico. The homeland from the fam. My family's from uh, Ibonito y Barranquitas, Puerto Rico originally. But I was born in the U.S., so I always tell people, Jared, soy americano, <laughs> a Puerto Rican-American, right? Yeah. Uh, let me see. Fort Myers, home of beaches. I like Fort Myers, man. It's got a nice small airport in and out, man. So, again, I'm going to give it a couple of minutes. So now's the time to go get yourself a refreshment. Uh, and like I said, we're going to start in about one or two minutes. So let the folks roll on in. Let's enjoy it, man. Uh, I think you're going to like what I have today, man. I think you're going to like it. I think you're going to dig it. It'll be a nice evening way to chill in the evening. By the way, if you have recommendations on how to make this better, this whole interaction thing or the courses I do here, the um, the Sales After Dark, let me know. Like I said, I just called it Sales After Dark because I, I figure I'm going to start doing this in the evening. And so why not call it Sales After Dark? Nobody has that name, so I took it. Uh, Felix Figueroa. Most people say Felix, but I know you guys say Felix, right? Victor, can I be like you? You know what? You can be like me if you want, man. I think you should be better than me, though. That's what I think, man. Boston, Massachusetts, representing. Boston, Massachusetts, representing, right? Something like that. So, <laughs> oh, man. One day I'll have to tell you my, uh, my gang stories when I was a kid in Chicago, inner city. And, hell, since we're waiting for people, I'll just tell you right now, man. The, so anyway, so I was born and raised in Chicago. Uh, we lived around uh, North Avenue, Nashville. It means nothing to some of you people. Uh, Humble Park, Logan Square area. Different gangs, right? And so the biggest gang uh, at the time were Latin Kings who were black and yellow. Coincidentally, I didn't plan this this way. By the way, black and yellow were the biggest gang. And I remember that if you go every, like, I don't know, I'm going to say every mile or two, it was a different gang. So there were different colors that you had to wear. So you always had to be careful about what colors you wore. Or else you get confused, and I have stories. Uh, Raleigh, North Carolina, love Raleigh. I love the South, man. Like I said, we've been in Georgia now for 15 years. Uh, I'm digging the South, man. I, I like the South. We'll probably 
wind up here just stay here in Atlanta, Georgia. So, and we're kind of opening up. So I don't know about you guys, but we're like opening up. So it's really nice to be able to, you know, get out and do something, right? Being inside, man, that's rough. So for the folks in New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Chicago, New York, California, man, I, I, I feel your pain, man. Thanks for the shout out, man. Thank you, man. Thank you. Appreciate that you love the content. And like I said, whatever whatever you have that can make it better, man, I, I'm not very proud. So if you have some suggestions, always leave them in the comment. And like I said, always do me a favor, man. Share this with at least one person, man. That's the only price you have to pay, price of admission. So let me see. We got, it's 9.05. You guys are ready to get going? I think we should do this. What do you think? And what I want to talk about today is, is I think something that uh, it, it's, it, it's, it's more of a mindset shift. It's tied to sales, directly to sales, but it's a, it's a mindset shift. And it's based on, let me pull this up before I forget, because I know I'll forget this. So I have a course. Now, where is this thing at? I think I forgot where I put it. But I, what I wanted to show you was I have this. Bear with me one second. I just want to show you something real quick. Because if you're part of the Sales Velocity Academy, I want you to know where you can find this. And so there is a course called Better Sales Habits, and I'm going to be talking about video number two today, video number two in this series. So this is one of the, uh, the video courses in the Sales Velocity Academy, and this is the one. That's the one I'll be talking about. So video number two, there's a lot of good stuff in there. This is a great video course. So if you want to become more efficient, more effective, uh, this is a good one, man. All right. So I think we should jump into this thing. Let's see more people jumping on. New York City, man. Hope you guys are staying safe. New Jersey in the house. Brian, you Scott, not in Chicago. Uh, De Niro, again, probably set up a day so that we can schedule it. Cool. All right. Now, so let's talk about, I was reading, I'm an avid reader. Uh, if you were in my uh, last few sessions I've done, I talked about how I read a lot, right? So I typically get up very early, like 5.30 in the morning. And for me, uh, uh, there was, there's a guy by the name of Dan Ariely. He wrote a book called Predictably Irrational. If you've read Predictably Irrational, hit the number one. And he wrote an article, and I remember reading it. He said, everybody here, that includes you, has two golden hours. Two golden hours. Two golden hours where you're mad like focused, right? And everybody's different. So uh, the good qu the question to you is, what do you what do you think your two golden hours are? Like when you think you're like, man, you're like, you know what? You can focus. For me, 5.30 to 7.30, you know, maybe 6 o'clock to 8 o'clock, somewhere in there, but 5.30 to 7.30, it's like my brain just goes, <laughs> it's like I can comprehend things. You ever read things and you just like, you read the page and you just don't even know what you've read. Do you know what I mean? So uh, tell me what your golden hour is. What do you think your two golden hours are? Everybody has two golden hours. Where do you think your two hours at where you can hyper focus? And this is a great starting point because uh, I want you to start keeping in mind, when are those hours? Because that's when you need to do what I call those high leverage activity. A high leverage activity is those activities that if you just did those would move your career forward, right? In this case, let's say your sales career forward. So again, write some down. Philippines is in the house, man. What, Jerome, thank you for joining us, man. I love the Philippines. Was there a while back. Um, so keep that in mind. What are your two golden hours? So again, 537. So I read a lot. So anyway, People keep asking me, Victor, what do you read that you love? Now, on this program, I will only show you books. I'm not going to show you books that are okay. I'm not going to show you average books that are, yeah, that's, that's a pretty good book. No, I'm going to show you what, in my opinion, are the best of the best. The, the, the thing is, I have one of the smallest bookshelves. Like, you ever see other speakers? They have like a, like a, like a, I don't know, like a million books behind them, right? Not me. I'm totally opposite. Here, how's this for a mind shift? What I do is every year, at least twice a year really, I purge. I throw books away. If I throw away, I give them to Goodwill. And so what I do is I donate books that don't make the shelf. In my shelf, I only have room for maybe like 100 books. And so every year, twice a year, I purge. So I only keep the best of the best. So I will only show you what I consider are some, some books that to me have shifted my brain, like maybe go, huh, I didn't look at it that way. Or sometimes, like this book I'm about to show you, it's one of those books where you kind of knew the concept, but the author went really deep into it, and you're like, ah, oh, there was like gold when you when you read the book. And the book is this one right here, Atomic Habits. Let me see if I can shine off of that thing. I'm going to highly recommend this book. This is an awesome book by James Clear. And so I want to talk a little bit about this book a little bit, uh, but not so much about the book. There's a concept in here. And by the way, here's my philosophy on reading, right? 
Now, not everybody has to read. I know, I know a lot of people don't like to read. They just like to watch a video, like this one, or they like to, uh, you know, a podcast or whatever it may be. But for those of you who like to read, and you can probably get this in Audible, so you can hear it on audio, but the visual has to be there, though, or you'll miss something, right? So in this book, you know, when you read a book, this is, this is kind of my thing. People are always like, you know, this book costs, what does this book cost? Let's see the price of this book. It's $27, right? And $36 if you live in Canada, A, eh? right? So, so $27 for this book, that's a lot of money. 27 bucks is a lot of money, right? That's a lot of coffees at Starbucks that I could buy with this thing. And so, but my, my philosophy is that if I can just get one, just one thing out of a book, that's the return on investment I'm looking for. If I can get two, that's even better, you get the idea. And in many cases, I usually get one great idea. I say, well, I got a lot of good ideas. Those are the books that don't hang around. But when I get a great idea, I hang on to this book. Like this book will not leave my shelf. This has made the top 100. So, so I want, and by the way, if you, it's Atomic Habits, Tiny Changes, Remarkable Results. Now, we're all familiar with the 1% rule, right? But what I like about what James Clear did here, we'll keep it here just to kind of advertise this book a little bit. This guy should pay me some money next time I see him, right? I look, I look forward to meeting this guy. Who's this? Uh, you guys are awesome. New Zealand, even in the house. Wow, New Zealand. Thank you for joining me. So this book, and by the way, uh, my books are almost unusable when I get done. I'm going to show you. I mean, I brutalize my books. Like, I write all over my books. That's, that's, I know you can't see it, but let me see if I can get the right lighting on that thing. But anyway, so that's all my writing. That's just my notes in the back page. So when I, when I go through a book, I literally interact with a book. Like, I mark it up. Like I put, I know you can't see the notes really, but even on the, I have my own shorthand that I use in the, uh, you know, I put an eyeball when it's very insightful. Uh, I put a cue when it's a, big, a good question. Uh, if it's key, exclamation point, put key. So anyway, I really mark up my books. And I think that's a good way of reading a book. Instead of reading it passively, I actually interact with the book. Like sometimes I'll put like, you know, WTF, like what the fudge? I don't believe that. I don't agree with that, right? I actually write stuff like that in my books. So anyway, I digress. Let's get back to the book here. So in this book, he talked about the 1% rules and he gives it, he gives an example of, of an Olympic coach for the British bike uh, cycling team and how this gentleman, I forgot his, uh, Brailsford, I think is his name, and how he basically took over of the British cycling team. Uh, and they were like a team that nobody respected because they had won hardly any gold medals. And to make a long story short, he talked about how he was looking for 1% improvement in everything they did. So everything from the, the bike seats, like they reshaped the bike seats, from the clothes they wore, like the actual uniform the bikers wore, uh, they would rub alcohol on the tires just to make sure they'd grip. Uh, they would clean the actual inside of the trucks uh, where they carried the bike so no dust would actually get in the wheels and slow down, you know, as far as the axles and the bearings. And so all these little things, including bringing the players' mattresses with them so they can get a good night's sleep when they were traveling. So all these little things were called one percenters, right? And he called it, he had a great phrase for it. He called it the, ag he called it the aggregation, see if I can spell right, the aggregation of marginal gains, right? This is not what I want to talk to you about. By the way, this just means the sum, if I could just, the sum of small gains. That's the translation if you don't like the big words, right? The sum of small gains. In other words, by adding up all these small gains, you begin to build up this momentum to the point where, you know, after so many years that they never won like a gold medal, they started winning gold medals. I think in 10 years, they won like five gold medals because of this aggregation of marginal gains, this sum of small gains. And so I think this is interesting because, you know, we're all Tony Robbins fans, right? And Tony's always talking about, wow, let's take massive action, right? Well, this book is almost talking about take incremental action. In other words, that's his philosophy. It's the one, he talks about the 1% rule. So he gives two graphs. These are the two things that kind of blew me away. And he gives great strategies for creating new habits, better habits, but, I want to share with this with you, this graph, because when I saw the graph, being an engineer, it impacted me because it, it visually made sense. You know how sometimes visually you have to see something to kind of go, ah, I get it, right? And so he first drew, drew the first graph. The first graph was like, if this is where you're at today, performance-wise, this is you performance-wise today, right? He says, if every year, I mean, if every day you got better by 1%, you would see 
an exponential growth like that. So you would grow. We're going to talk about this in just a bit. And so this exponential growth is just like that. Now, if you decide not to read, not to watch videos, not to stay up late watching Victor Antonio talk about sales and motivation, then what happens is over time, again, this is performance right here, right? Performance. What happens over time is that you just go like that. Or as they say in the engineering world, you go to asymptotically towards zero, right? In other words, you just begin to decrease. This is important because it's an interesting curve. We, people who don't keep up with their skill sets typically just decay slash decline over the years. But what's interesting is this curve right here. Now, this curve right here, when I ran the numbers, because this is a 1% every day. Now, think about this. If you increase 1% every day. Now, I had to run some numbers. Again, my brain just works this way. I go, I go 1%, and I wrote this number down. I want to make sure I got it right. Did you know? Because, oh, well, let me just describe the 1% first. So, okay, so if we could increase 1% every day, I want you to write this down. This is cool. This you won't find in a book. What I'm about to do right now is not in the book. I just added this. If you increase 1% every day, here's a question. If you increase 1% in 50 days, every day you increase 1%, how much would you increase? Write your answer down. If you were to increase 1% every day for 50 days, how much would you think you'd perform? Now, over 50 days, would you be 10% better, 20% better, or 50% better? What do you think it is? It's not what you think it is. Here's what it is, because most people think, if I in increase 1% every day, in 50 days, I'll be 50% better. No, the thing is, remember, when you increase 1% after the first day, you're 1% higher, so 1% on top of the, let's say, 1.1% is actually higher, so you actually accelerate. So, if you want to double your performance, like double it, get twice as good, I came up with the number and it's more like, to get to 2x, it'll take you 70 days to become twice as good as who you are today. Think about that, 2x, 2x. So let me see, Jerome, pulse to 50? No, Jerome. Run the numbers, like take one, right, and then add 1%. You get 1.1, right? Then multiply that, increase that 1.1 by 1% again. And so that's, it's a very interesting number when you run it. So 2x. So what's also interesting is that this is this will happen in 70 days, right? Now, further out, somewhere here, somewhere here, you'll be at 10x, right? And I believe, I don't want to get the number wrong because I, I wrote it down. You'll, in 232 days, this puts you about July or August. If you started in January, by July or August, you'd be at 10x. That's, by the way, that's, I, I wrote 10x just there because I thought it was cool. So my man, Grant Cardone, you guys know from Grant Cardone? So anyway, you got a great book, The 10x Rule, right? So I'm gonna show you how to be better than The 10x Rule, right? Just joking, man. But if you go here and you keep doing the 1%, on top of the 1%, the 1%, 1%, did you know, at the end of the year, at 365 days, 365 days, you will be 37x better. You'll be 37x better. That's better than 10x, right? So, and by the way, the 10x rule is really a cool thing. It just says basically, you know, almost like, you know, 10 times the effort, whatever you're doing. And that's one way of looking at it. It's a great model, right? 10x everything you're doing. Just go at it harder. But what if you could also, maybe it's like the, you know, if you can't 10x something, what if you just got 1% better? And if you did that for a whole year, you'd be at 37x. Think about this, it. kind of a mind blower, right? Because what is it gonna take you to get to 37x? It's just doing 1% better every day. Now, that begs the question, what does that mean? You know, people give you these numbers and you're like, okay, great, that's nice to know. What does that mean to me? I'm gonna tell you what it means to you. If we believe in the 1% growth, what does that mean? What does that mean? Well, how about this? Did you know, did you know, you're going to see this for the first time. You've never seen this before. That's why you're hanging out, sales after dark, right? Did you know that in one year, one year, there are 500, I have to write the number, 525,600 minutes. Yes, there is, right? If you don't believe me, divide that by 365, right? Which means 
in one day, there are 1,440 minutes. Boom, 1,440 minutes. I know. Where are you going with this, Victor? Wait, just wait. Now, remember what the remember the the golden rule, the two hours, the two golden hours everybody has, two hours. When when I tell people two hours, like, oh, Victor, I can't dedicate two hours to that. I just can't do it. I can't do it. I can't do it. Right? I said, how about one? Ah, that's too much. Well, what if we just do one percent? What is one percent of one thousand four hundred? So, in other words, one day is equal to one thousand four hundred and forty minutes, right? If you think about it this way, that's one way of looking at it, right? It's 1,440 minutes, right? Now, if you take 1% of that, you times 0 0.01, right? Multiply 1%, you get 14.4 minutes. That's right. So the 1% rule is that you dedicate just this amount of time every day to self-improvement. I'm giving you a number, man. Nobody's ever given you a number. I'm giving you a number. That's it. 14.4 minutes is all you have to dedicate each day to get better at something. Focus. Because some people say, I can't focus for two hours. I know. I get it. Can't focus for one. But I know you can focus for how many? 14.4 minutes. That's 15 minutes. That's all you need. That's your 1%. If you could get 1% better every day, I mean, really do something in 15 minutes to get better, learn something, podcast, read, whatever it may be, there it is. That's a solid number, man. So now you have something in your brain to work with, right? This is interesting. So you guys dig that? Is that cool? Kind of gives you a metric, doesn't it? Uh, is this live? NH, yeah, it's live. I'm reading your comment right now. So it's live. How did I get two thumbs down? How did I get... <laughs> So many haters in this world. All right. Good to see you from Mexico. Saludos. Felix. Changing. Hey, Vic. Live. Yeah. Changing live, Victor. Appreciate you like a big brother. Thank you, man. Respect. The So anyway, this is one way of looking at this, right? So again, it's how do you get better every day? How do you get better every day and accelerate who you are? And so think about it. You know, now if you know that you can dedicate 1% of your day to getting better, why not? So again, thank you. Do you guys like the idea, man? I love it. I love the fact that you like the idea. And again, this is a great book. I'm going to highly recommend this book, This Atomic Habits. It really is a great book, worth the investment. And like I said, it's got stuff here on how to create better habits to maybe even get to that 1% every day so you're consistently doing it, okay? So check that out. Anyway, that's the first book. Got another one for you, but not yet. Not yet. Now, so, so far... Let me go back because I wanted you to see this. Remember this right here? Remember this right here? Right? 2x, yeah. 10x, right? Again, let's go beyond 10x. Let's go to 37x. Yeah, why not, right? So now, James Clear had another graph, so a very similar graph. And this one, I want you to pay attention. Come in, because this one is the important one. All those were good. All that stuff is good so far. But what I want to show you now is what happens when people simply don't succeed. Okay, let me wrap this up. Let me really put a bow on this thing because what I'm about to show you now, and this is what really got me about the book, is when James Clear drew this out, I go, oh, there it is. The reason some people succeed and some people simply don't. You're about to see it right now. And if it sounds dramatic, it should be because it's that important. Now, so he almost has the same graph and let me, let me, he says, basically, this is time, right? And let's just call this success. And by the way, success could be defined in anything. It could be success in sales. It could be, you got a promotion, you're, you got you, whatever growth you're after, right? If your business, you're profitable. So this is all success, right? Now, when we invest, when we invest, what's going to happen, right? What happens is if we invest time and let's call that money also if we call this success or if you don't like that either let's just call them results if we invest our time we expect to what grow true or not this is what we typically expect right that's what we typically expect right if i invest time if i invest money then i should see this linear growth pattern right this is like a linear growth pattern that's what i should see but the reality, as James Clear points out, that's not. This right here, he says, is what you expect. What you expect, right? That's what you expect, right? Now, he says, but what really happens 
is nothing like that. This is not real. This is this right here is math. That's a linear equation, and life is not linear. And he says something, and this is where it really he says, this is what happens. That happens. And he calls this, he did a better picture of this. And so he goes, he goes, that's what you expect, and this is what really what really happens. What really happens. This is what really happens, right? And so this is interesting. Let's analyze this thing. Because again, if you really look at this graph, it's a powerful graph. What happens is that when you invest time or money, what happens is you rumble around here and there's nothing happening. This could be like two to three months. Nothing's happening. Remember, remember that whole thing about just trying to get to 2x? Nothing's happening. There's no visual. There's no, there's no visual confirmation that anything is happening. And all of a sudden, he, and what he says is that you'll start seeing some growth. And then even if you start seeing some growth, your expectation is up here. So if you just do this, that's your expectation. That's where you think you should be. But this is where you're at, right? That's a gap. And that's where you're at. And so what happens is a lot of people, he called this right here, he called that, and I thought it was an interesting name. He called it the zone, uh, I think it was disappointment or disillusionment, but I'll just say disappointment because I like that word better. The zone of disappointment. He says that most ideas die here because you didn't go in there long enough. In other words, real success where your expectations start beating reality happens somewhere out here. I don't know, that could be nine months, that could be a year, I don't know what that number is, right? And so all of a sudden, but once you hit this point, if you notice this right here, it really takes off. So you may not see anything for a while, but when it hits, bam, it hits. And then this is just, this is just you taking off. This is just your business or your sales taking off. So when we, let's tie back to the 1%. By invest, investing 1% every day, you're not gonna see. If you study sales, you study sales every day, and you're not seeing results within the first 30 days, you're still like right here. Well, you're not gonna see results. I mean, by the way, I'm not saying you're not gonna get better. And you may close an extra deal. Great for you, excellent. But keep in mind that if this is, let's call this three months, you know, and we're not seeing results, you just keep investing. And this, you know, I don't like using the word faith a lot, but you gotta use faith here. Because if you're doing the right things, by the way, notice how I qualified that. If you're doing the right things, the right way, you're investing the right time, the right amount of effort, the right amount of focus, then eventually this will turn. How do I know? Because I'm living proof of it. When I started doing, true story, I'm gonna take you back a little bit. When I started doing, YouTube uh, videos. Like I remember posting, you know, uh, two or three videos every week. But the first week I did videos, I think I got like two views, maybe three views. Way here. And I was like, oh, what's the point of doing these videos, right? Because then I did it for a month. Then I did it for two months. Then I did it for three months and nothing. And nothing. It was like, it was like I was still down here. But I thought I should be where? Up here somewhere. But in my mind, I just kept saying, all right, just keep doing it, just keep putting out quality content, just put out the value, and hopefully people will recognize that value. So just keep doing that, right? And so what happened is, after a while, you can see my subscriber count. By the way, if you're not a subscriber, hit the subscribe button. And if you like this, hit the like button. But all of a sudden, you know, it took a year or two before I started seeing some real traffic. And then this right here eventually kicked in where now I get a lot of traffic to my website. And now the traffic to my website, to this YouTube channel, or even to my website, has generated for me so much money. I'm not even exaggerating. And I don't want to throw a number out there because it's like, you know, I hate when people do that. Let's just say it's been good, right? And I'm saying to you is that many times we get caught right here and we give up. We just give up too quickly. Now, we, we just like, it's like we're not, again, we think we, we should be here, but we're not seeing that. We're still down here. Now that you know you're here, this is the good thing. This is what I loved about the book. Because what he was saying is, if you know you're here, you think you should be here, but you really know you're here, that keeps you going. The book that motivated me to do videos, and I, I say this often, was Gary Vaynerchuk's book. Uh, I think it was Crushing It. It came out in 2008, 2009, right? Uh, that's when Gary had his wine library TV, and he didn't swear as much, right? 
right? And so, and I remember he was like, video, video, video. He was ahead of his time, man. He was video, 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 way ahead of the time. But I remember thinking to myself, and I just kind of went by faith that the market was going to be there, that if I just keep putting out great content, the market would meet me there. And sure enough, that's exactly what happened. So how do I tie it back to you? Is that like, you know, if you today, you're in sales, I'm assuming you're in sales, right? And by the way, we're all in sales. We know that story already. But if you're trying to grow your revenue, you're trying to grow your business. Look, the people that watch me are typically this. Salespeople, obviously, who are trying to grow their numbers, right? There's entrepreneurs. If you're an entrepreneur, give me a big E for that one. Just give me a big E, right? Uh, if you're a salesperson, just give me an S, right? And then there's small business owners. Let's call them SBOs, man. If you're an SBO, hit the SBO, right? And then there's people in large corporations, right? These could be sales managers, right? Just right, corp. And so either way, we're always selling and we're always trying to grow and we're always trying to learn more. If you're a salesperson today and you're struggling, I am telling you, maybe we just need to invest at 1% every day. What's 1%? You now know it's 14.4 minutes. That's it. Everybody has 14 minutes. Even if you're in your car, you're riding a bus, you're sitting in the back of an Uber, everybody has that amount of time. So we got some SBOs, sales engineers, and we got a sales entrepreneur. So everybody has enough time to do that. Everybody has enough time to study something. So I wanted to show you this because this is really powerful. If you think about it, if you just sit back and think about it, this right here should calm your brain down. That if you're not seeing the results right away, it's okay. As long as you're investing the right time, the right resources, the right focus, and delivering quality content, I'm telling you, this thing will turn. But most people quit right here. And that's where James Clear had it right. And I've never been able to articulate that. You know, you can say it, but there's something about this graph. When I saw it, I go, oh, what a beautiful way of articulating that concept. So anyway, got a couple of corpse here, banker. I won't hold it against you, man, Felix, that you're a banker. Just kidding, man. Anyway. So, makes sense so far? One more concept and then I'll take some questions and we can talk. This one's really dedicated to, you know, I joke about like the 10X rule, which is a great book. By the way, if I may recommend, uh, uh, Grant Cardone, the 10X rule is good, but his book that's made my 100 is called Sell or Be Sold. So, um, I'll write it down, Sell or Be Sold by GC. I think that, in my opinion, my opinion, could be wrong. Maybe you'll like, you'll like this annex rule better, but Seller Be Sold, I think, is his best book that I've written. He's got a lot, got a lot of great content. Love him or hate him, doesn't matter. You know, that's, that's one of the things we have to learn, by the way. I, I see too many people judging other speakers or traders. And my philosophy is everybody has something to offer. Am I right? Everybody has something to offer. If I asked you what type of music do you listen to on your, you know, on your phone, I'm sure you don't have one artist. You have what? Multiple artists, right? And so I, I look at the, the, the speaking world, the trading world, people with ideas in that way. Everybody has their point of view. Our job is to what? Find the best points of view, things that fit our ideas of what we need, and then bring that together. I think that's a healthy way of doing it. Yes? Oh. So... This is my dachshund, and I told her not to come upstairs. I know, I know, but she's not listening, so anyway, this is Pebbles. So, all right, why don't you go downstairs, or just lay right there, just lay right there. Anyway, sorry about that. Uh, so, I want to share with you one more concept. Again, I love these concepts because they kind of change your brain a little bit. So, let me know what you think of this. What do you, what do you think of this concept? this atomic habit concept of what I just showed. Give me a one if you like it, zero if it didn't mean anything to you. One or a zero, hit me, man, hit me, okay? And then um, this other concept, it's kind of tied to the 1% rule. And I'm gonna go off on a small tangent here, but I'm gonna bring it back, okay? Uh, and so I was, there's a guy by the name, and here's the book, All right? Made the top 100. Jordan Peterson, the 12 rules for life, right? 12 rules for life, right? And again, a lot of good stuff in there. This dude, this guy's heavy. I'm just letting you know. I'm warning you now that this is a brain bender. This is, this is a guy, I like Jordan Peterson. Uh, I'd rather listen to him or watch him on video than read his book. He's heavy. Uh, it's really heavy, man. I'm glad you guys like the book, man. Great. So 
he was he was Jordan Peterson was being interviewed by by Joe Rogan, right? And they were talking about um, I forgot what the topic was. I just remember the concept. And you know, Joe was talking about going into the gym, working out, you know, putting in your reps, and and basically uh, Jordan Peterson he says that's the wrong way of looking at it. He says he says in order to motivate yourself, you shouldn't try to psych yourself up. You know how like all of us have something we want to do, we know we need to do, but we don't do it, right? We don't do it. And so in that interview, he says, what you need to do is lower your goals. Yes, he said, in order to be successful, you should lower your goals. Now, I'm paraphrasing what Jordan Peterson said, okay? I'm just paraphrasing, but just bear with me. I'll give you the concept. So he says, uh, she's like laying right there. Uh, so she's, uh, he said, basically, lower your goals. I was like, what? And he said, think of any task that you need to do. So think of any task. Now, if you're a manager, you want to listen to this, okay? If you're a manager, you want to listen to this. Here's what he said. He said, he said, what you want to do is when you're trying to motivate somebody, instead of trying to convince them that they can do it, like, yeah, man, you can do it. You can sell a million dollars this year. All you got to do is this. You can do it. You can do it. You know, because, you know, motivation doesn't last because at the end of the day, you got to go home or you got to go back to your office and sit in front of that phone and make those calls, whatever it may be. Go do the presentation, set up the meeting, do the demo, whatever it may be. And so he said, lower your goals. And what does he mean by that? He said, he said to the person, look, if somebody tells me they can't do X, I just lower the goal. And I immediately translate this into the following. Let's say I'm talking to a salesperson and the salesperson is not hitting their number. And I ask him or her, how many calls are you making? He says, well, I'm only making, you know, like 50 calls a day. That's it. Now they know they should be at 100, right? And but they can't get motivated. Sometimes they hit 20, sometimes they hit 30, whatever it may. The numbers aren't there. And so I said, "What is the minimum amount of calls you're willing to make?" Here's the the key question. "What is the minimum amount of calls you're willing to make every day consistently, not 20, 50, 10, consistently every day?" Is it 20? All right, let's just say he started with 50. Is it 50? No. He says, I don't know if I can do 50 every day. How about 40? I don't know. Every day, I don't know if I can do that. What about 20? What about 10? Right? Let's be ridiculous. Okay, what about five calls? Okay, let's say eight. Eight calls. That's one call. Can you do one call every hour? All right? And it's an interesting concept because what he's saying is that you lower the goal so much so that the person just can almost step over it. Now, here's what happens. If you think about it, there's power in that statement. It's a ridiculous sounding statement but there's power hidden behind it. Because what he's saying is that in order to be successful, we know that consistency is key. Consistency and intensity, right? So let's just add those two up. It's consistency, right? Plus intensity, right? Intensity. Now, intensity is always viewed as passion. I don't like the word passion. I don't know why, just maybe because it's overused. I like intensity. Intensity is like you believe what you have is so good, the product is so good that you just look, you want to buy. You know what I mean? It's like that. You got to have that intensity. You got to believe in the thing. I believe in sales training. You become sales, you'll always make, learn how to sell, right? The consistency piece, because you can have all the intensity of the world. How many people do you know are passionate about something? Just passionate. I want to share my message with the world. I think I can do this. I want to do that. I want. They're passionate, right? They want to do something. And they, every year they talk about what they want to do. The problem is they're not consistent. They're not what? Consistently going after that goal. Keep that curve in mind, right? They start, but they're not consistent. So, and there's people who are consistent, but then they're not passionate. There's no intensity. So you can be consistent, but then how you talk to customers how you do the presentations, how you do the demo. If there's no passion or intensity, it's not going anywhere, right? So that this is like the one-two punch. Consistency plus intensity, right? You combine those two, you're good to go. So back to this little lower your goals. So imagine if I'm talking to you right now. I'm your coach. Right now, I'm talking to you. There's things I know you should be doing in order to grow your business, grow your revenues, whatever it may be. And then I'm talking to you. Imagine us in a room, one-on-one, -on -one, having a conversation. And I say to you, you're not hitting your numbers. He said, and we go through your, what you're doing all day. We try to analyze what's going on. We look at your activities and we come to the conclusion. Again, I'm just using cold calling as an example. And we realize that, you know, you're just not making enough calls. 
And sometimes you're motivated, sometimes you're not. That's what you tell me. Sometimes I'm motivated, sometimes I'm not. Welcome to the club. So are we, right? And then sometimes people have, you know, call reluctance, right? Cold call reluctance is real. People just don't want to get on the phone. But then when you challenge somebody, say, well, what's the minimum you're willing to do? Like, what is the minimum you're willing to do? And that's when you get into the 50 calls. No, 40, 20, 10. How about eight calls? One per hour. And the person's going to say, yeah, I can do that. Can you commit to that, though? I know you can do it, but will you commit to it? See the difference? There's always a difference. I know you can do it. I, met, I know a lot of people who can do a lot of things, but are you committed to doing it? Big difference. Consistency, right? Committed. So he said, the person says, yeah, man, I can, Victor, I can do one call a day. All right, we'll go do one call a day. That's it, one call an hour, rather. Does one call an hour. Now, you know what's going to happen, right? He's going to do one call. He's going to do one call. He's, then he's going to get a little momentum. He's going to probably do a second call. And maybe by half day, he's already done his eight. Now, he could probably go home, relax, whatever it may be, but he's going to say, you know what, let me just make one more. And what begins to happen, just like when you work with weights, right? Once you start putting in the reps, once you start working the weights, over time, what begins to happen? It's the same analogy, the 1% rule. You start adding more weights. In this case, they'll start adding more calls. And so maybe I want you to think about it this way. This is where, I, if you're stuck right now, because mentally, we all get stuck. We all get stuck, including Victor Antonio. Victor Antonio gets stuck. Victor Antonio is not perfect, right? But when I get stuck, I always ask myself, okay, what's the minimum you're willing to do? Because you know how sometimes you just don't want to do something? You're like, I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. Like when I jump on live, people say, you know, how often do you want to jump on live? Are you motivated? I said, sometimes I don't want to do it. Today, I did want to do it. But there's days I go, eh, I don't know if I want to get on live. And then I said, well, what's the minimum you're willing to do to get, go live? I said, all right, you know what? I'll speak for like 15 minutes and I'll stop. All right, I can do 15 minutes. I mean, I'm having this conversation. It's almost like, you know, multiple personalities going on here. What I'm saying to you is that think of something that you've been not wanting to do. Maybe you're afraid of doing it, right? Maybe you just simply haven't tried it. It's just fear, right? The fear of the unknown, fear of rejection, whatever fear you want to throw out there. And then ask yourself, well, what is, what is the minimum I would be willing to do? you know, to get this going. Because you know that in order to get to where you want to go, you have to go through this. We never go around the fear. You got to go through the fear, right? So my question to you is, if you're feeling stuck right now, what is the minimum? When I mentioned earlier about the 1% of 1,440 minutes a day, 1,440 minutes, that's 1% 1 of that is 14 minutes, 14.4 minutes, almost 15 minutes. Could you at least do that? That's all I'm asking you to do. Now, even if you said to me, Victor, I'm a mother, I'm a father, I'm busy, I got kids, I got a dog, I got whatever it is, I don't have 15 minutes. I would say to you, what do you think I would say to you? Well, I don't know, do you have 12 minutes? Do you have 10? Do you have five? Come on, I know you got five in there. Everybody's got five, right? And then I get the person to say, oh, I'll do five, Victor, I'll do five. Now, what do you think is gonna happen? You tell yourself you're gonna read a book for five minutes. You know what's going to happen, right? You're going to wind up reading for 10, 15. And again, that's part of the process. So sometimes it's not that we need motivation from the outside world to tell us what we need to do. We don't need that. Sometimes we just need to talk to ourselves. And, you know, because your brain is always going towards the path of least resistance. And the path of least resistance is not doing it, right? But if you ask yourself, okay, I know I don't want to do it, but what is the minimum I would be willing to do just to get this going? So think about building a website. Ah, I don't want to build a website right now. It seems overwhelming. Okay. What's the minimum you would be willing to do? Well, maybe I'll just like design one page. How about an article? Ah, I hate writing articles. I don't like writing articles. Okay. What's the minimum you would be willing to do? Would you write 300 words? That's a full page. No, 200 words. I don't know. You can be like Seth Godin. He writes like, I don't know. Sometimes he writes like 20 words, 30 words, and that's his post, right? Because he gets it. He gets it. You, you give what you give. And so hopefully this is motivating you to kind of rethink how you look at things. So again, lower your goals. By that, if, you, if it seems you know, insurmountable, just lower that number and then maybe that'll motivate you. And this is how we begin getting that 1% every day, the 15 minute reps every day, 15 minutes every day, learning, watching, listening. And that's how you get there. Anyway, I am done. How far did I go? That was about 40 minutes. So. All right, man. All right, Brian feels me, man. Uh, let me see. 
love a cup of tea uh, says good and here I'll bring it over I'll bring some of these comments over it's, it's kind of cool some of your comments are very cool I'll bring that over let me move this out so you don't say that uh, good and sound words my biggest fear has always been calling even to people that like and trust me I just struggle using the phone well cup of tea guess what so do we I mean anybody who says they love sales is psycho there's just something wrong with them they're bent the wrong way you know and if they like it it's because they've learned to love it you know what I mean because they figured it out you know but nobody nobody comes out saying I love sales let's do this let's let's go after rejection nobody says that but once salespeople figure it out then I think they love sales those people are not psycho they're just well trained so ask yourself love a cup of tea what would be the minimum you'd be willing to do and sometimes that fear has nothing to do with picking up the phone it's something you don't know what to say write out a script right like on cold calling write out a script by the way my sales pitch if you're not part of the sales velocity academy check out what we got i got a great cold calling program and things to help you get over that mindset because it is a tough mindset but you can do it you can do it all right so let me see got this is uh dj dj mike love your energy sir you nailed it thank you mike for hanging out man appreciate it let me see uh don't go man when is the next sales after dark i have no idea felix i just if it hits me, it hits me. I know everybody wants me to do them like on a regular schedule. Dude, it's like, you know, I don't want to do it just to do it. You know what I mean? I want to do it because I have something to say to you that you guys can listen and go, okay, that was worth my time because I do respect your time. You know, it's like when I put this content together, I'm asking, I don't want to I don't want to be the guy that tells you things you already know, right? Because then it's just, it's not cool, man. I think you waste other people's time. I like, I like real content. So hopefully that's why I always ask for your feedback, you know, What's this, 11, what is this one? I don't know what this one means. I'm trying to drag this one over because it's interesting. 11 times one, you gave you 11 ones. I have no, 11 ones. Okay, we might, you might be talking about the percentages, right? I think. Book of the Month Club, must read. Uh, Herb, uh, in the last Sales After Dark, I'm reading a book right now that's bending my brain. It's taking me a while to read because it's like, mm. It's almost like the Jordan Peterson book. Like, this is a brain bender. Uh, it's called Impossible to Ignore. Impossible to Ignore. And it's all about how do you stand out? How do you become memorable? So whether you're in sales, whether you're doing presentations, or even you're doing an interview, you know, it's it's how do you become impossible to ignore? That's that's the book of the month for me, man. Let me see. what DJ Mike, again, I just pulled you up. I, I, by the way, I'm just pulling him, so I don't know who's there. Uh, I would appreciate if you give us some speaking power tips and improving conversation with clients. You speak so good, speak so well. Uh, dude, DJ Mike, I mean, I had to practice. I, I talked about joining Toastmasters. I think you have one in your area. And a, a quick story about Toastmasters. There was a guy, Mike, you'll love this, man, DJ Mike. I think it's DJ Mike, right? And so you'll love this because, you know, I came from the inner city, right? So let's just say that my verbal skills weren't the best. Yo, know what I'm saying? You know, and so it was, it was pretty bad. And we had this guy, his name was Hale. And Hale was like, when he spoke, it's like flowers came out of his mouth. You know, he was so elegant. I was like, I could never be like that, right? And what Hale did to me was almost, he brutalized my speeches. And I remember I hated him for it. I hated him for it. But after a year, I realized I was getting better, and he would correct everything. My diction, uh, how I said things, my phrases, and everything. That's why I think Toastmasters, if you go to toastmasters.org, is a great organization. So I think that's the biggest power tip. I am telling you, it is the best investment you'll make in your career. There's a Toastmasters in your area. Go check it out. All right. Went, uh, everybody wants to know. Uh, Andre, uh, I don't know, man. I don't. I don't it's like I said, when the mood hits me, man, I know, I know it's frustrating you guys. I get it. I get it. Uh, you said the words I needed to hear it today, man. Thank you, man. Jesus Enriquez, man. Thank you for hanging out, man. Appreciate it. And again, if you like it, hit the like button. I don't know if it's there or there, but it's somewhere. And then one of my favorite names, Ransom Barrel. Awesome information, dude. I'm telling you, it should be a movie, man. And let me see. I missed a couple up here. Uh, this one I like here. Let's see. Uh, wonderful stuff, Victor. I imagine myself busting down brick walls every time I cold call. There you go. Hey, man, whatever visual gets you through, there it is, right? It's not, I mean, I mean, when you look at cold calling, what's the worst somebody says? No. You know what I mean? No. Okay. Next. You know, it's not that, I think sometimes we just psych ourselves out 
And I think that hurts us. De Niro, thank you for hanging out. Appreciate it. Uh, and this this guy gets it, man. Or she gets it. I don't know which. So let's go to, for no's from everyone. I mean, it's one of those things where it, it, it doesn't hurt. I think when you're making the calls and you're getting, you know, you're having these conversations, what you're really trying to improve on is your verbal skills. And with every call, I swear to you, I know this for a fact, with every call, if you get you out of your own head, you're going to learn something from that call and you're going to get more comfortable with the script. You're going to start flipping words, changing words. That's when people always ask me, hey, Victor, can you give me a great cold calling script? No, I can give you guides to a great cold calling script. But at the end of the day, you got to add your flavor. You know what I mean? You've got to add that sabor. you got to have that that is you and find the right words. Just keep playing. Uh, I was listening to a guy today. Uh, his name is John Barrows. If you know John Barrows, just put JB. Uh, and he said something interesting. He says, and I kind of knew this already, but he just put a nice little emphasis on it. In one of his uh, videos, he said, you know, take two scripts and then do a split test. By that is you, you got script A, use that on, let's say you're making 10 calls a day, right? Use, you know, script A on five people and use script B on another five people and begin to measure and be scientific about it. And I, I really like the way he said that. I thought that made a lot of sense. But it's little things like that. Uh, let me see. This one says, Brian, been following you for years now, man. Love your energy and videos, man. Thank you, Brian. Love your cool. You got that, uh, what is that guy, Roy Orbison go look going on there, brother? It's heavy, man. It's heavy. Uh, so I can call Just Struggle. So I can call Just Struggle. Okay, I have to finish that one up for me, a cup of tea. I don't know what that meant. Uh, peace to the fams. Thank you, man. Thank you. Appreciate it. Fam is good. Hello from Chicago. I got one from Chicago. It's Chicago Pilsen area. It's it's no for now, not forever. That's what it is, right? It's like, yeah, no for now. And let's move on. I, I, the more you can depersonalize it, and I think that's the trick, right? Is depersonalizing rejection. I get it. Okay, no. Keep, I mean, just keep in mind, they're not going to think about you. Uh, I arranged two face-to-face -face meetings today, so I'm happy. Cup of tea. There you go. That's how we begin. One here, one there. Uh, it's all struggle. Every salesperson you meet, every sales trainer you meet, every sales speaker you meet has gone through that. Where you're like, oh, another rejection. Or I'll get back to you, and they never get back to you. I can't, man, if I, if I gave you the number of times I've been burned or screwed, it would blow your mind. I think your content is better than 1% every new video. Dude, way to use a Sammer. Dude, the winning comment for today. I'm going to give it to you, man. Way to use the actual lesson, man. That's cool. Uh, let me see what this one says. Uh, what should be focus of conversation during a presentation and B2C sale while selling financial services? You're going to go there, right? Everything was light to you just got heavy on me, Arvind. Uh, the, but it's a good question, right? It's a good question. So what should be the focus of the conversation? Uh, Arvind, I don't know if you were in the last uh, sales after dark thing I did, uh, but what I talked about in the B2C sales, remember, it's, it's almost like you've got to get in their head, right? You, you got to figure out, you know, the word I often use is this one, is empathy, right? Before you sell anything, I would empathize with people, right? And I was using this example today, Arvind. I'll, I'll give you this as an example, Arvind. Uh, I was talking today to somebody who, about you know, people who buy cars. He's like, you know, well, Victor, how do I sell cars? I said, well, begin with understanding why do they even want a, car, a new car? And he thought that was the worst thing to ask, right? Why, why do you want a new car? I go, no, it's a great question to ask. Like, why, why do you, because what you're going to find out is that, one, there, there might have been a trigger event. What do I mean by a trigger event? A trigger event means their car broke down one too many times. They're like, screw it, we're getting a new car. So that's their motivation. The trigger was the car broke down, right? And so now, what do you think they're worried about? What's the biggest concern? Price is obviously always a concern, but they're always also concerned about what? maintenance and reliability. So now they want, if you know that the trigger was car broke down, that's why they're getting a new car. I know now that the focus of my conversation will be this, money and also maintenance and stability. In other words, make sure that it's reliable. If I'm talking to a family about financial services, I would I'd have to ask the questions. And so some of the questions might be, Arvin, uh, again, financial questions, how old are their kids? That might be a reason to talk about finances, right? How old are they, right? So, for example, if I'm talking to a couple, um, so I do a lot of coaching on the side. By the way, go to my website, thevictorantonio.com, if you want to find out about my coaching program. 
So I'm, I'm working with a gentleman who sells insurance. And so we started slicing and dicing and segmenting his market. And what we realized, obviously, as we went through the process, that, you know, if it's a husband who's single, or not husband, I'd rather a single man, he's going to have one point of view. When he's married, he's going to have another point of view, more responsibility, you know, uh, more wanting of insurance. But also, if they have kids, that adds another layer of complexity and need of stability. And depending how old the kids are, for example, if they're only two to five, there's only so much consideration. They're not thinking about college. But if they're 14 or 15, they're thinking about college. So now, Arvin, I would be into that conversation. And these things would be my focus, depending on who I'm talking to. That was a long answer, man. Sorry about that. All right. So this one, let's see. This one looks like a big one. Love this, Victor. Do you believe in repetitive asking for order and a call, meaning to go for the close, or objections must be blocked so that only one or two closes would be necessary? I think you only need one or two, man. I really do. Uh, because I think you... Get away from the number of closes, right? Let's not be so empirical about it, right? But uh, your point is well taken that, you know, how many times am I going to ask for the order? Well, at least once, <laughs> minimum. But again, one study showed that I think it was like 67% of people, 67% of salespeople never ask for an order once. Uh, so I don't think there's anything wrong with trying to close more than once, right? And so, and you should try, by the way, let's keep in mind that, you know, once you feel that it's going to close, close it. Don't keep talking. Just close it, right? Don't be like some people who sell beyond the sale. Uh, that means they keep talking when they could have closed it and they wind up losing it. And so I always believe that if I can reduce the resistance and I know my presentation well, I can look at the person and I can tell if they're with me or not. And I'm sure you can also, right, Rod? After a while, after you do so many, you can go, this person's gone and you're rarely wrong because all of a sudden you can read the body language, you can read the facial expressions, you can read just the quality of the questions they're asking you, Rod, indicates to you that that's a buy. Boom, lock it down, right? That might only require one. The, I'm telling you, I think, I don't think, I know that the days of ABC always be closing are, are behind us. Can you still make money pressuring people on a close? Yeah, of course. It happens, but it's more the exception, not the rule. Because what happens if you sell somebody and they have buyer's remorse, they're going to talk bad about you. They're going to go up online and they're going to leave some bad reviews. And, and if you're worried about net promoter scores and things of that nature, customer experience, this is a problem. So I would say that you should at least attempt to close once. That's guaranteed. Twice, I think you're still in the ballpark. I would definitely, two would be like, yeah, I think it would be like the ideal number if I were to give you a number. But I'm just guessing. Typically, it's either one or two. Typically, if you can do it in one, that's the best. Like I said, uh, in the last uh, conversation I had, I said, if you, and I'll draw this high so you can see it. If here's the beginning of your presentation, and, that's, and this is the arc of your presentation, I already know what question I'm asking there. Based on what I've shown you, is there any reason we shouldn't get started? Right? Now, if they say, well, I need to think about it, well, then I'm going to have to have a conversation about what they need to think about. So, and again, I'll go through that, through that process, and then I'll probably ask again for the order. So that's a perfect example of having to ask at least twice. Hope I answered that, man. All right, let me see what I got here. How do I sell when there's a language barrier? I was selling well while I was in Australia, but I'm struggling to replicate the success in Malaysia. Tough one, man. I don't know. How's that for an honest answer? I don't know, Brian. I, I think it's, uh, I would ask somebody who sells there locally what might be the problem. Because sometimes, uh, it, it, you know, there's two ways of looking at this thing, right? Uh, I used to sell in the Latin America. And believe it or not, when I did my presentations in English, even though I can do them in Spanish, I closed more. Why? Because they saw me as somebody coming from the outside with an outside perspective. And that's how I positioned myself. Obviously, I talked Spanish while I was there. But if I, had to do, if I could do the presentation in English, I just did it in English. And for some reason, I had that, I, I don't know what to call it. It's almost like you get more credibility coming from somewhere else. So the question would be, how, can I, how could you leverage you being from New Zealand when you're talking to your clients there? That, that would be, it's a, tr it's a hard question to answer. So, man, sorry I can't give you more on that one. And I don't like making stuff up, man. So, you know how that goes. Okay. Wait, wait, you were here last time, weren't you? I remember this one. The hardest part I found about the phone sales, in my case, quotes, was asking them questions such as, how do you feel about the price I quoted? Well, that's because that's a horrible question. Uh, now I've done it so many times, I'm confident. Why would you ask that question, though? 
But if it's working for you, keep using it. You know, when you, the thing is, when you, when you ask somebody, be careful with this, but when you ask somebody, how do you feel about the price I've quoted you? You know, how do you feel? Well, that tells me, I mean, that's begging for somebody to ask for a discount. Yeah. You know what I mean? You got to be careful with that language right there. How do you feel about the price I quoted you? But as I always say, WAP, right? If it's working for you, don't listen to me because maybe you figured out a way to refine it and put it in your presentation and it works. But be careful because you might get some pushback on discounts. When you ask somebody, so what do you think about the price I just gave you? How do you feel about the price I just gave you? I'm like, well, I feel it's a bit high. Now where do you go? There's a discount question, right? So what if I just gave you two options? Based on these two options, which one of these best fits your needs? Now they just got to choose. But this one might open you up to a discount. In fact, type in if you get a lot of requests for discounts. But again, listen to me, man. If it's working for you, don't change anything. Okay? Because again, this is part of the art. And if you figured out a way to blend it into your conversation and it's working, go for it, man. All right? I wouldn't use it. I mean, that's, that's just me, though. That's just me. All right. How do I become an introvert and not lose my and not lose my how do you become an introvert? I mean an extrovert, Felix, right? Extrovertido, no? You want to become an extrovert. Uh, on the extrovert, uh, how do you become oh to become an introvert, just stop talking. Right? So to become an extrovert, uh, believe it or not, I was an introvert throughout my uh, like high school. And it wasn't until college I started coming out of my shell, but I was, I was an introvert all my life. Keep in mind that um, who was the guy that wrote the book Drive? There was a guy who wrote the book Drive, and, and it was based on a study done by Adam Grant. I'm going off the, the top of my head. But Felix, I want you to keep this in mind. Maybe I'll talk about this next time. They did a study, and they looked at sales price, right? And they looked at introvert and extrovert, right? They looked at introvert on one end of the spectrum, extrovert, and they were looking at the average sale. And what they found is the curve that looked like this. And what they found is right here, there is something called an ambivert. I'm not making this up. And it's the ambivert that's sold the most. Because if you're too introverted, you're not asking enough questions. If you're too extroverted, you're not listening because you're talking too much. And it is the blend, right, of the two. Listening on this side, this is listening, right? Listening and then asking questions. You can blend these two together, you become an ambivert. So right there in the middle. And again, we're always you're always gonna fight against enthusiasm, but again, what if you just dedicated 1% of your day, 14.4 minutes, to just reading something or watching videos like this? So thank you for joining me. Uh, let me see, what does this one say? And then I'm gonna start wrapping up, folks. What are some great ways to train entry-level salespeople for, the re for real estate? The, Chris, what, one of the things that, that we fail to do, and this is such a great question, man. You could do a whole conversation on this one, but here's the long and short of it. I always ask people, when people always talk, we talk about time to value, right? If somebody, Chris, when somebody comes in for the first time, let's say that, let's call that value. In other words, they're performing, right? And let's say that the numbers, that's the level you want them at. That could be a revenue number, however you measure value. And typically, if you bring in, I'm just saying, a real estate salesperson, it may take them, I'll say, about, let's just call that three to six months before they start bringing in some real value, right? So the question you're asking me is, how do we what? Shrink that. In other words, how do we get them to value faster? That's really the desire, right? How do we get them to value faster? This is called time to value. It's a great phrase to know, right? So when we talk about training people and bringing them on board, let's talk about time to value. And so the question is, how do you shrink their time to value? One, sales process. You probably know what the, is that already laid out for them? Two, one of the things I would do is list out every possible objection, every pitfall that they're gonna possibly encounter and have that documented and train them on that. And then number three is I would do role playing with them. Ask them all the tough questions and maybe have them, you know, whatever it may be, have the one-on-one -on -one conversations, whatever needs to be done. In other words, do you have a blueprint for them when they walk through the door? Do you have a real training program? Not just, here's a sales process, here's your business cards, you know, here's your ML, you know, 
just get some listings, right? Start marketing. I mean, do they have a plan? And in the last conversation, we talked about shaping the path. So go back to the last one, Chris. I think it was the last one. We talked about shaping, no, maybe two of them. It's called shaping the path. Just look for it. And that might give you some indication on what you need to do. So, but I would have some type of orientation program right up front, man. Like, and I would practice, you know, sales process is good. Marketing, what do they need to do to start marketing? You got to give them numbers, Chris. That's the big thing, right? So you got to tell them, look, the most successful salespeople are doing $50 a day. They're investing this much money on online marketing. They're doing this. They're doing that. That's the blueprint. That's what people want. And whatever that may be, if that's documented, I think you have to stand a better chance of shrinking that time frame. So hopefully that helps, man. By the way, Brian, cheers to you, man. Thank you, brother. I don't want to oversell by talking too much. Yeah. Like sometimes we just got to pull back a little bit, man. I got Roddy. What is, what's the best source lead source for HNW prospective buyers. I don't know what HNW is. So you're going to have to educate me, help me out. I like to tell you I know everything, but don't, I don't know everything. Uh, let me see. What should be the appropriate answer, in your opinion, to the I will get back to you uh, to a used vehicle industry online? When somebody, I mean, this is such a tough one, but I mean, my whole thing is I want to know. So I would use a line like this, Mr. DJ, when somebody tells me they're going to get back to me, that means one, they're just trying to be nice and they're not interested or they're interested. They just need to think about it. Which one is it? And I let them know if you're not interested, don't waste my time. I won't waste your time. Right? So when, again, the line could be something like this. When somebody tells me they're not in, I'll get back to you. It's either a, you're just trying to be nice to me, right? You're just trying to be nice to me and you don't want to tell me no or you're interested and you, you will get back to me. Now, if they say, no, I was just trying to be nice, then you say, good, now I know I won't waste my time, thank you, appreciate your time. And by the way, you can ask them questions like, well, is there anything, yeah, I'm not trying to sell you anymore, but you know, is there, is there a reason why you're not interested? Maybe you can get some information that you can use on the next sales call. Let's say, no, 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 I'm interested, I, I just want to get back to you. I said, well, great. Then I say, pull out your calendar, I'll pull out mine. When can we set up the next call so I, we can, we can discuss this. How does tomorrow at two o'clock sound or would the next day be better, the day after? Something like that. But you, you're gonna have to listen and engage their answer. Once you, once you listen to the tone of their answer, you'll start to get it. All right, I gotta start wrapping this up, guys. All right, cup of coffee again. All right, by the way, uh, let me see this one right here. If I, great answer, pure value. Thank you, Chris, appreciate that, man. Uh, just a quick question, is LinkedIn marketing still worth it for selling consultancy service in your opinion? It, it, it's too big of a question. Uh, all marketing is good. I know you hate that answer, right? I, me too. Uh, but it really depends on, like anything else, we gotta measure it, right? Love a cup of tea. It's almost like you gotta measure what's valuable. So if you have, if your customers are there, it's more B2B, then yes. But keep in mind, that there's several ways to market on LinkedIn, right? It doesn't have to be all pay ads. You can create some great content, like create some video content, write some blogs slash articles, comment on people's posts, who you're trying to connect with. Uh, in my Sales Velocity Academy, I have something called the uh, uh, Predictable Prospecting, which gives you this rhythm on how to actually go after new business, whether it's on LinkedIn, Facebook, and so on. But again, the answer is yes, it just depends on the actual content. Oh, high net worth. Now, Rod, I gotta go back. Rod, what's the best lead source for high net worth individual? I don't know. Sorry, you defined it. So high net worth prospective buyers, where would you go? I don't know. That's a good question, I don't know. In fact, Rod, when you find that, why don't you let me know? I've never had that question, so it's a good question. Um, let me see, I think I got most of these questions. So anyway, man, if you love this again, hit the like button. If you haven't subscribed, why not? Uh, and check out the Sales Velocity Academy. You know, again, great courses to help you sell. And for those of you who, who are just catching this, remember this, this is it. Just go in there and that's your discount. Get 50% off if you hit that in the coupon code, uh, just for you because you hung out this long with me. And by the way, cancel anytime. So this is not a, uh, you know, forever day, but you gotta cancel though. So just cancel. If you only wanna use it for a month or two to get what you want, use it for a month or two and get what you want and then just quit. I don't take these things personally. So again, you're not gonna offend me in any way. I want you to go in there. It's almost like a buffet. You know, you take what you want, 
And when you're full, you leave. You're not, you're, you're not meant to stay there forever. You're meant to go in there, eat, enjoy yourself, get the hell out, go make some money. And then if you feel guilty, send me a commission check, something like that. All right. Uh, so let me see. Go there, high net worth. Okay. Da, da, da. Yeah. Go where they hang out. I mean, that's the obvious answer, right, Chris? Go where the high net worth people actually hang out. Victor, thanks for hanging out with us. Da, da, sharing. Uh, I'm interested. What streaming software you use for this live? It's called Ecam. The letter E, Cam, C A M M, Ecam. Ecam. There you go. Cool. All right, guys. On that note, I think I'm about to sign off. Thank you for joining me again. If you loved it, hit the like button. And I will probably do the discounting one. Uh, maybe the, the discounting one will be the next live I do. And I don't know when I'll do it, but I got a feeling. I got a feeling I'll probably do it Tuesday night. I think. Later, people. Remember, selling ain't hard when you know how. Take care.